and um, happy Friday, everybody. Uh, it is uh, week three Friday, and uh, and we're all here. Uh, you guys are all here. I appreciate you guys being here. Uh, you know, we're not even. Um, <laughs> Are we one third of the way through the lecture uh, course? We're not, we're not, but our lecture uh, attendance has dropped off by over 50%, it appears. I think we had 80 enrolled on my, or 80, 80 are still enrolled, I think, or maybe, maybe 78 or something like that are enrolled, but, and we had close to that in attendance on the first day, but, you know, now we're, now we're below the 40 mark. Um, you know, it's okay. My feelings aren't hurt too much, um, and uh, and I appreciate especially appreciate those of you who have your cameras on. And if you don't have your camera on, but you're willing to turn them on, uh, now that I'm appealing to you, uh, appreciated. But those of you who do have your cameras on, thank you, thank you very much for uh, for doing that. Um, we got to talk about um, coming back in person on all of that. Um, this the school has released some guidance and has basically kind of said professors so I'm going to talk a little bit about this which just might mean we're going to be rushing I'm, we're always rushing the last few slides but um, even more so I have to talk a little bit about this um, so starting Monday January 31 I will be teaching the class in person okay so I will come to campus you know barring anything crazy happening I'll be coming to campus and I'll be teaching the class uh, in person I will continue to record my lectures, all right? Uh, they will not be on Zoom, okay? Uh, I, I've got some screen recording software, so I'm gonna be recording the lectures on my computer, and then I will post them online, okay? But it's it won't be kind of this simul live broadcast thing. So you, uh, if you're not in person, you, you cannot like log in at 10 o'clock, you're gonna have to uh, just watch it later after it gets posted. Um, I will continue to use view quizzes and, uh, you know, just to kind of encourage everybody to kind of keep up with the material and you should be able to keep up with the material, whether you are attending live in person or um, watching it after the fact remotely. Okay. And of course, if you're in person, you know, everybody's got to kind of follow those, the UCLA's uh, rules, which are like your masks now to be what they need to be medical grade or N95 or something. Uh, you got to do your, you know, symptom monitoring survey and, you know, no food or drink in class, stuff like that. Okay. The biggest issue, the biggest issue I'm facing, and this is where I need, um, I, I want to kind of um, just, well, the biggest hurdle with, with this is how do we handle our exams? Okay. So we've got, um, we have a midterm exam scheduled for uh, Wednesday of sixth week. All right, so this is my plan, and uh, we'll see if I get a ton of pushback. But but the, the the plan is, you know, if you're coming in person, you'll take the exam in person, okay? And and I'm hoping this is going to cover like 90, 95 percent of the students, okay? Now I understand there's going to be a, a small, uh, and I'm and I'm hoping this number is a small number of students who either simply cannot come back to campus, or you know maybe this is like in a foreign country, can't come back or, you know, so, something, right? Or, you know, something. So, or, or, or students just, some students just might not be comfortable being in, in class. And so I'm willing to make um, like accommodations for people who can come to class, but just don't want to be in the classroom. Um, you know, I can have you take the exam either, you know, in, in my office and kind of this, you know, reduced person environment. Um, or, you know, maybe you can schedule something with CAE if you already have accommodations uh, with them. Um, and then, and lastly, there might be students who just can't do an exam in person at all. And so, uh, you know, for, for those students, I'm going to have to do a remote exam, okay? Now, the, the unfortunate thing about this is that the people who take the remote exam by the very nature of it being remote, is going to have to be a different exam and different in nature from the in-person exam. Okay, and uh, and my preference, I think, the in-person exam is a is an important exam or a better suited. And and what I mean by this is, um, the in-person exam, you know, is going to be pen and paper. You know, you don't have a computer with you. 
And the in-person exam is gonna test your ability to read code, okay? It's gonna test your ability to read code. Uh, Cause you know, what it will be is I'll have lines of code and I'll ask you, you know, what is this line? What are these lines of code gonna output? What are these lines of, is this outline of code gonna produce an error? And I can kind of ask, you know, questions like that. And the in-person exam will test your ability to read. By the nature of the, uh, having an, a remote exam that's taken on the computer, that just means you know the computer student has access to a computer, has access to R, has access to the internet, has access to all of the class notes, things like that. And so the remote exam can't really ask you the question, what, is, what are these lines of code gonna produce? Because I mean, I could say, please don't use R, but you know that's like almost impossible to enforce. So um, I, I can't ask questions like, what are these lines going to produce? Because obviously, you know, the student can just type it into R and get the answer. And that's, that's not an exam. That's just, can you retype my code? Um, so a, a remote exam would be more like you have to write, you know, you'd have to, and, and it would be kind of, it would probably end up looking like a homework assignment, except you've got like this, you know, much shorter time limit, like you've got to you get like two hours to write your, you know, your solutions to a, you know, homework problems and stuff. And, and so um, already the way I feel is, you know, the homework already gives you um, uh, opportunity to practice your writing skills as far as code writing skills, all right? And, the, and, and you, you're working through that and, and the homework already does that. But reading is also just as important. Because uh, when you uh, <laughs> when you go out into the workforce, if you're going to be working with code, um, it's just as important to be able to read either your own code or someone else's code as it is to be able to write and produce code. Um, and you know, sometimes sometimes people have so much frustration reading that they just say, you know what, forget it. I'm going to just rewrite this <laughs> whole thing from from scratch um, because at least I'll know what's going on. But reading is, is, is very important. Um, reading is, um, is because uh, basically when you encounter errors, you need to be able to go back and read through your, each line of code and know what each line of code is going to do. Because if you don't know what your line of code is going to do, then it, it might be doing something that different from what you think. And then that could be the source of your error. Um, so, so reading is an important skill. And there's not really a way to test reading in your homework and, and it gets tested in, um, in an in-person exam. So anyway, um, that's the plan. Uh, I'm expecting, but well, I don't know. Uh, maybe, you know, you can give me a, a reaction here and um, we'll say, what are, what are my reaction choices? Okay, give me a, I guess, give me a thumbs up if you, plan on being in person and then give me a red x if uh if you will um if there's like no way you're coming back to campus <laughs> um and, and and this will just kind of give me a gauge of you know what what i can expect all right so i'm seeing a lot of thumbs up so a lot of people are planning to be uh, uh in person i've got i've got one red x um all right and so uh, and then some people are saying i'm debating oh i guess we'll, we'll have a uh i don't know What's that? We'll do the coffee. Coffee if you're if you're on the fence or something. Okay. Um, okay. So we got some people on the fence, um, and, and that's okay. We'll 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 talk about this, and hopefully um, there aren't too 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 many exceptions. Um, but uh, but yeah, um, we'll we'll try to um, I'll try to be flexible. I'm I'm hoping for the vast majority. Um, you know, we'll be in person, we'll do the in-person exam, um, but yeah, we'll, um, um, and you know, <laughs> be, because I'm trying to be flexible, you know, I, I hope students can be, understand that, that the exams are going to be different, they're going to end up testing different things, um, and you know, ideally we want to give everybody the same, same difficulty and same things like that, but it's just, in this situation, it's, it's, it's not possible to make exactly equivalent exams and, and, uh, and you guys you just have to understand that and i don't you know it's not my intention to make one like granted much harder than the other but i have no idea 
Uh, yeah, and then the live attendance probably skews for the people. I mean, the live attendance are really the. Um, I, you know, this is being recorded, so never mind. But um, anyway, I appreciate you guys being here live. So, and then and then also fully understand if you can't attend live and you're watching the video, I appreciate you watching the video too. So, um, just just thanks for keeping up. Okay. Um, Let's uh let's get a get a look here. We got tidy data. All right, so um maybe you know for those of you who are here, who has have you guys who has reshaped data? Who has um ha, have you pivoted data using the tidyverse? <laughs> Does that even make sense to you? Okay, so if you've pivoted data with the tidyverse, yeah, give me a give me a thumbs up. So I, I see one person with the okay. All right. Well, then, um, most of you have not given me a, a thumbs up, so we'll um, well, we'll talk about it here. Okay, um, we're looking at R for data science. Uh, this this stuff comes straight from this uh, this book. Great, great book. Hadley Wickham. Hadley Wickham is like the I don't know what his title is. He's he's like the, one of the most important people at R Studio, and he's written pretty much. Um, a bunch of code and libraries that have really made it. Um, yeah, he's he's the primary author of the tidyverse, and uh, and and he has this book uh, R for Data Science, and the great guy he is, he um, he has published the entire textbook online. You can read it in your browser. Okay, uh, if you want the paper copy, you can you can buy it at any bookstore you want. I mean, any bookstore that carries it, but um. But yeah, you can also read it in, entirely in your browser. Okay, so the tidyverse is kind of this, what, what he says is an opinionated collection of R packages designed for data science. And they all kind of share an underlying design philosophy and, uh, and grammar and data structures and includes um, ggplot is part of the tidyverse, but it also has you know the uh, libraries or packages, tibble, tidyr, deplier, reader, per, uh, stringer and four cats. Uh, in our class, we'll take a look at tidyr, deplier, and ggplot, and I guess tibble. Um, we might not have as much. Oh, and I guess we've already covered readar. Um, we won't have as much time to cover per and four cats. Oh, we'll get into stringer. Actually, we're getting we're going to cover quite a bit of the tidyverse. I'm <laughs> as I'm going through that list. I'm like, oh yeah, we actually covered a lot of this. Okay, um, the tidyverse works with tibbles, which are basically modified data frames, okay? Tibbles are data frames effectively, but they tweak some of the older behaviors. R, R has actually updated some of the behaviors. The R core team has updated the behaviors of um, data frames based on basically the popularity of tidyverse and things some like that. Um, but, you know, they don't like to, the, our, our core team that updates base R, they don't really like to make drastic changes because when they do, it often breaks older code and people, um, people don't, don't like to do that. So, you know, a lot of innovation uh, is made through the packages and the tidyverse is constantly updating, constantly coming out with new releases. So, so th this is, I guess, if somebody had to complain about the tidyverse, you know, they might say, well, you know, I use the tidyverse and then later on, they made an update and my old code doesn't work anymore. And, and that's going to be a common experience when you're using the tidyverse because they're, they're constantly innovating, constantly updating things. And so, um, so sometimes, you know, you write some code and then, you know, you get this message, you know, this has been deprecated. This is different now. Um, okay. So anyway, here's a, here's a tibble and, uh, and I'm making it just like I would make a data frame, except I'm writing tibble instead of data frame. Uh, and here we're going to just take, um, you know, the time and add some random numbers to it um, and things like that. Um, and I've got, you know, the numbers one through a thousand random values, uh, a sample of random letters and things like that. Um, do you need to install? The, oh, yes, you will need to install the tidyverse. So you just do install that packages tidyverse and it's going to install everything. Okay. And so here I ask, print out the, the tibble, and this is what it looks like, okay? So I got columns A, B, C, D, E, 
And then it shows me the first 10 rows and it says with 990 more rows, okay? But it says it's a tibble, 1,000 rows, five columns by five, thousand by five. Um, versus, um, I don't know if you've ever printed a data frame with a whole bunch of rows and you, or maybe it's an accident and then it just like explodes your console, right? And, uh, <laughs> and it's like just lines and lines and lines and lines and lines of stuff. And, and then, you know, if you want to scroll back and see what was the previous line of code, it's like you have to, you're like scrolling for, uh, for days, it feels like. Uh, the tibble is nice, you know, by default, it only prints, um, it only prints 10 lines at a time. And if it's super wide, if, you're, if your data frame is, or tibble is very wide, it only prints what fits on the, uh, in the console or in the screen and, um, uh, and just kind of lists the additional um, columns later. When you um, subset a tibble, it's always going to return a tibble, okay? Unless you explicitly say drop it, right? Where, which is different from a data frame, right? So in a data frame, if we say, hey, I want the first column, it's going to simplify that first column and return um, a, a vector or something like that. Whereas the tibble, when you use single square brackets, you will know that when you subset the tibble, it's always going to be a tibble. Okay, and that's kind of its, its, its own philosophy. Now, if you want to simplify it down to a vector, you can. You can say drop it down um, with, uh, with true. But, um, but other than that, um, it'll, it'll stay that way. Whereas if you use the double square brackets on tibbles, then that's when it will, it will do sim, uh, simplification. Okay, so tibble double square brackets, first column will give you the vector tibble uh, dollar sign. So double square brackets are used to kind of extract and that's when it will simplify, whereas single square brackets are used to subset and it will always return a tibble. Um, making a tibble is easy. Uh, you can you do it the same way you do a data frame or you can take an existing data frame and just throw it into tibble and then you get all of the kind of the nice features of the tibble. All right. Um, and then there's a few other ways. There's the tribble. <laughs> Okay, the t, t, this is a tibble where you're writing it by row. So here um, uh, you give it basically the name with a, with a tilde. And, and so here I'm basically entering the data as if, um, you know, row by row. Because normally you say, here's the column and here are the values. Here's the column name B and here are the values. But you can, you can enter a tibble um, and create it row, uh, row wise. And that's using the, uh, the function Tribble. Okay, so if, um, if you're ever reading someone else's code and you see this thing tribble, and you're like, "What? What? Are, what is that?" That's a tibble rowwise creation. Okay, um, that that that's enough on tibbles, though. We're going to talk about pivoting data with the tidyverse, and the philosophy of the tidyverse. This is why um, Hadley says his uh, packages are opinionated. Is that um, it is structured around these, these rules. And <laughs> a lot of times in your stats class, we just present these and say like, your data has to follow these rules. But the truth is, is your data doesn't necessarily have to follow these rules of being organized into tables like this. But when you have tidy data organized in tables, every column is a variable, every row is an observation, and every cell has just one value. So each column is one, um, one variable and every um, variable has just one column. Each row is one observation. Uh, every observation is one row and so on and so forth. Uh, let me give you your first view quiz answer for today before I uh, keep going. First view quiz answer is E, E as an elephant. E as an elephant is your first view quiz answer. Okay, so here's an example of tidy data. And this is uh, um, just a simple data set. We've got storms, the name of the storm, the wind speed, the air pressure, and the date that this storm occurred. Okay, I guess tropical storm uh, and things like that. Okay. So this is date, each column has its own variable. Here's an example of data that we might not consider tidy, I, I, I guess, depending on who we're talking to, but um, 
we not, might not consider this to be tidy data. So this, was, I think, is like cases of some disease in the years 2011, 2012, and 2013. And if we think about what are the variables here, we have the variables for country. This is France. DE is Germany, okay? It's not Denmark or something. Uh, DE is for uh, Germany and US. These are the countries. Uh, that's one of the variables. Another variable is the year. And then the values are um, how many cases we have, okay, the count. So our variables are arranged like this, okay? One, one variable forms column headings. Uh, we have variables, uh, values are spread out around, among the columns. Okay. Here's another example of data that we might not consider to be tidy. Okay, they're, they're all arranged in tables. So um, um, we have, uh, in this case, one variable is the city, okay? And we can see, you know, this, this is repeated twice. We've got New York, New York, London, London, Beijing, Beijing. So we've got the city. And then we have particle size and amount. Um, and so, yeah, what's the definition of tidy? Again, definition tidy is one, one row per observation, one column per variable. And so if we say, well, it, what is my observation here? If my observation here is a city, you know, this, we don't have tidy data. Now, now somebody could say the observation is a, a city particle or something, particle size um, combination. So maybe, so it's a little bit of a flexible thing and we'll, we'll talk about that, okay? But right now, if we say, let's say each observation is a city, then really what we have, um, the variables that we have are the city, uh, we have the number of large particles and we have the number of small particles, okay? And so our values are stored in one column, but it's like every other value is a small particle. Every other value is a large, uh, is the amount of large particles. But these are the values, the city name, the amount of large particles and the amount of small particles. And so the challenge is, how do we get data from things that are not tidy like this and this into something where we have tidy? All right, so this is just reading in the data. These, these uh, exist as CSVs um, on GitHub, and so I'm just reading those in. Okay, well, when you have tidy data, there's nice little things you can do. Because R does vectorized operations, you can just do vectorized math to get your, um, your values here. So we're gonna just do um, dollar sign pressure, storms dollar sign pressure divided by storms dollar sign wind. This will be the ratio between pressure and wind. And, um, and we're gonna store this. And basically it does, you know, 1,007 divided by 110 gives me 9.15. 1,009 divided by 45 gives me 22.4. 1,005 divided by 65 gives me 15.5. And it does this element-wise vectorized operation and it creates a new column. And that's, that's something we can do when it's tidy. We would not be able to do something um, so, so simply uh, like this. I mean, we can take a difference between 2011 and 2012, but you know, um, that it, it might not be so easy. So, so how do we work with this table, okay? What if we do want to make it tidy where we have, um, um, the country as a column, the year uh, as a column, and the count. Okay, so every observation will be like how many, how many cases were there? What, what is the count of cases in this particular year? So these are our variables, and we're going to rearrange our data to be tidy. So we have one column for the country, one column for the year, and one column for the count. How many? How many rows and how many columns are gonna, am I gonna have in the resulting data? What will be the dimensions of the resulting data if I, if I rearrange this? Three columns and nine rows, that, that is exactly right. Okay, so nine rows, three columns, so we'd, we would get, we'd get a nine by three, a nine by three uh, table here, okay? Nine rows, three columns, okay? and 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 how we do this, you know, might 
uh, might look something like this. Okay, so this is done using this function pivot longer. Okay, we use pivot longer, right? Um, we call it, it's pivot longer because we're pivoting the, the data or like we're rearranging them and the resulting table in general will be longer, okay? Older versions of tidy are called this gather, but basically what we're gonna say is we, we're gonna do pivot longer. We're gonna take our cases and the columns that we are combining together. We are combining together the columns 2011, 2012, and 2013, okay? We're gonna, we're gonna specify that here. Combine the values in the columns 2011 through 2013, okay? And the names of these columns is important information. And so where are the names of the columns gonna go? They're gonna go into a new column and we are gonna call that column year. So it's just saying the names of the columns that we gathered, put that into a column and title that column year. Okay. And the values that you're gathering, put that into a column. And what should we call that? Okay. Here I wrote N. I could have written N, I guess, but I guess I wrote cases here. Okay. So we're going to say values go into a column called cases. These are just variable names. There's no inherent meaning. The only meaning things that have real meaning are the names of the columns that we're, we're combining here. Okay. So uh, columns are the names of the columns that you want pivoted. All right, and in this case, we want the columns 2011 through 2013. Okay, and you can kind of specify a range of columns using the colon operator. The names too is just a character string and the values too is also a character string uh, for you know, what you're gonna call the columns with the names and the column with the cases, uh, column with the values. So if we wanted to, <laughs> the names could be, just terrible names. These are terrible column names. We could say when it happened and how many, right? I, generally, you don't want to have spaces in your column names because it makes it a headache to, to work with. You end up having to use back ticks all the time and stuff. Um, at least use underscores if you need to have like multiple words, but you know, have, have good column names here. But so this is arbitrary. It doesn't have to necessarily be year and cases or something or n. It could, it could be anything for the column names. All right, so here's a question. What would happen? What would happen if I only pivot the columns 2012 and 2013? How many rows am I going to end up having? And what are the other columns? So I'm going to end up having six rows. That's correct. Uh, and how many columns are I going to have? Okay, well, this, let, let's, let's show you. Okay, we're going to end up having four columns. What happens is the columns that don't get pivoted get duplicated, right? So France um, gets duplicated, right? So we, we combine the 2012 and the 2013. And this column for 2011, it doesn't, it doesn't know. It has no contextual idea what, what any of this is. And so it, you know, if this was like the capital of France or something, um, it would duplicate that. Uh, in this case, it just says, oh, here's, here's a bit of information. We need to duplicate it, okay? So France, 7,000, Germany, 5,800, US, 15,000. These all get duplicated, and then just the, the columns that we've combined um, get pivoted. Okay. Uh, if I include the title country and I pivot that, what, what's going to end up happening? So we're going to pivot everything, all four columns, country through 2013. We're going to end up having two columns, a name column and a value column. And OK, well, oh, first, first it gives me an error. It says uh, we've got these are type double and these are type characters, so you can't combine them. So, so first of all, tidyr tries to help us prevent ourselves from, tries to stop us from hurting ourselves, because this is a bad idea. But, but I'm going to say, you know what? turn everything into characters, okay? Turn everything into characters and then do it, okay? So we're going to, um, we combine these things and now I have a column name, name of the, the columns that I combined. We got country 2011, 2012, 2013, country 2011, 2012, 2013. And then the values got France and all of these things. So this is just kind of nonsense and 
this is this this table has lost a, a lot of its meaning but um but it allows you to do that it allows you to kind of pivot the data um you know beyond <laughs> what would be practically useful all right so that's pivoting longer in this case we're going to do the opposite so we have pivot longer. The opposite operation is pivot wider, okay? And it's wider. Technically, we're on, I'm going to have three columns, so it's it's not actually wider, but it is wider in the sense that we're going from a bunch of rows. Here, I'm going to have six rows, and the resulting table, the resulting table is only going to have three rows, right? We're going to have one row for each city. We're going to have a column for large particle size, column for small particle size for how many. Um, how many values there. So we're going to end up having three rows, one for New York, one for London, one for Beijing, and three columns, the city name, the amount of large particles, and the amount of small particles. So this would be the result of pivoting our data here into something um, we would call this pivot wider. Okay. So how does this work? We're going to take the names, okay? The, the names of the new columns come from this column size, right? So we have large and small, large and small, large and small. Those are going to become the new column headings. Large and small become the, the new. So we're going to say the names are coming from the column size. And then the values that we populate in here, these values come from the column amount. So the names are coming from the column size and the values are coming from the column amount. And this is the, uh, the end result, All right? So again, the names from is the name of the column that has the names that will become column headers. Values from is the name of the column that has the values. And so that would be pivoting wider. And R is case sensitive. So we end up getting, um, you know, things happen if things aren't spelled um, correctly here. Uh, oh, before I keep going on, let me give you your second view quiz answer. Second view quiz answer is B, B as in bear, B as in bear. Okay, so what if I decided to change the, um, this thing from New York to NYC or New York City? And then let's run this operation. Let's pivot this wider, okay? Names from size, values from amount. How many rows am I gonna end up having? Okay, we're gonna have one row for each unique kind of city name, right? So, so we're gonna have a row for NYC, a row for New York, row for London, a row for Beijing. And when it pivoted wider, it said, okay, I have 23 for large NYC, and I have 14 for small New York, okay? But there was no value for small NYC and no value for large New York, okay? So when you pivot wider here, you end up getting four rows, and then you got these NA values. So, you know, you just want to make sure things indeed for the rows that you want to combine, you want to make sure that they're, they're spelled correctly. And that includes things like having um, a space, uh, an extra space, like a trailing space in the name is going to throw things off. If you have a different capitalization, right? Like one, maybe London is capitalized and another uh, it's lowercase or something, that's going to that's gonna throw things off. So, so you have to make sure your, the, the text is, is clean and consistent when you do something like a pivot wider operation. All right. Um, when you, uh, if you don't like the idea of having NAs, okay, you can specify uh, a fill value, right? So you can do values.fill. If you can't find the NAs, you can say, fill it with this number. And in this case, it's gonna be zero or whatever it is. Um, and that may or may not be what you want, okay? Um, always be careful when picking a value to fill, because that, that has uh, implications. Sometimes you're just like, oh, let's use the mean, but um, that 
might not be a good idea, right? If we're talking about like baseball player salaries, okay? What's the mean baseball player salary? Oh, it's gonna be like several million dollars, but that's because the mean is thrown off by huge outliers, right? You've got uh, Mike Trout and these, you know, these, these superstar baseball players making tons of money and that throws, that increases the average but if you think about like what's the median baseball player salary, I don't I don't know what the league minimum is. Maybe like four hundred thousand, five hundred thousand, something. I mean, nobody's complaining, but it's still um, it's 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 not multi millions for the uh, for the minimum there. Okay, um, here's uh, another example. Um, here I've changed uh, the this thing to be all caps large. All caps large. Okay, so let's say I pivot wider this. How many rows am I going to get? What are the dimensions going to be? Rows by columns. How many rows by how many columns? Rows by columns. How many? What's going to happen here? We're pivoting this wider. Names from. Yep. All right. So um, good job for those of you who responded. Three rows, four columns. We're going to have one row for each city. So the names of the cities combine fine, okay? We got New York, London, Beijing. But then as far as the columns go, we, we see three unique values in the columns. We got all caps large, small, and lowercase large here. So we got three unique values there. So we're gonna create three new columns here and we're gonna have this, right? And so New York with all caps large gets the 23, Whereas London and Beijing, they don't, they don't have anything listed for all caps large, so they get NAs. New York doesn't have anything for lowercase large, so we get this, okay? So again, it's sensitive to these kinds of, these kinds of uh, spelling differences. All right, um, oh, I guess we're gonna, I guess the lecture was short. We'll, uh, we'll end on time and after all. Okay, uh, pivot longer and pivot wider are inverse operations, right? And so, you know, I, I, I talked about tidy data and depending on the situation, we might actually want the wide version or we might want the, um, um, the longer version or something like that, okay? So here I have the pollution, it's in kind of long form and we did pivot wider and we get this, okay? So here's W. W is the result of pivoting our table wider. What I can do is I can take this W table and I can do the opposite and I can say pivot it longer, okay? Pivot longer, take the columns large through small and combine them into basically one column of values. So the names will go to the size column and the values will go to the amount column. And so the result of pivoting the wide table longer gives us back our original data, right? So if we, if we wanted this back, we could get it and we get it right here. So we have pivot longer and piv pivot wider and pivot longer are our inverse operations, okay? And, uh, and similarly, here is the original cases table. And what we did was we said, Com, um, pivot this longer, combine the values from the columns 2011, 2012, and 2013, combine those into one column, and we got this, okay? France, Germany, and the US, um, and these are all kind of repeated, and that's fine. That's pivoting the data longer, and, um, and, and maybe this is what we want, okay? Or maybe we look at this and we say, you know what? I actually want it to go back the other way. Well, we can take this result, which I've currently stored into L, and I can say, take L and pivot it wider. We're gonna get the names from the year column, okay? And, and, uh, and tidyr is smart enough to say, oh, you got numbers here, so we're gonna have to put back ticks on here, and that's fine. So we've got, um, but it takes the, uh, the names from here, and then it takes the uh, column counts and, um, and puts those and um, spreads them out, pivots them wider. Okay, so the pivot longer and pivot wider, those are uh, indeed inverse operations. Um, and, and hopefully this basically, a lot of times you're gonna be working with, with data that, that's coming in different forms. And sometimes you need to you know, rearrange them or pivot them. 
And so pivoting your data um, longer or wider is a, is a very handy um, thing and, and feature that, that you can do. And this is all done with, um, with TidyR, okay? And, uh, and you can read more um, at the kind of the TidyR um, article here. All right, and then there's another thing called uh, rectangling, and and I'm not going to cover this, okay? But this happens when you have like nested data. So this this happens a lot with like JSON data sets, and this is a little bit more complicated. But it'll be something like um, like if you're de dealing with like um, um, I don't know a movie, and you say like who's the director, okay? So uh, a lot of movies just have one director, but sometimes a movie might have co-directors, might have two directors. And so, you know, what do you do in that case? And, uh, and I guess, uh, and it's even possible that, it, that there's even more than two directors, right? It's very rare, but, but it's, it's possible that you have even more than two directors in, in a movie. Um, and so how do, how do we handle something like that? We might just have one column for director but we will allow that column of director to contain uh, one, two, or three, or you know, um, some arbitrary number of values. And so those kinds of things would end up being nested inside of each other. And, um, and TidyR is able to handle that using um, kind of nested data where it's gonna include um, lists inside for one of the columns. And that's handled uh, using this um, kind of the rectangling, the unnesting features um in tidy art but again it's a little bit beyond the scope of uh, of what i plan to cover so uh, i will not cover it but i will leave this up to you if you ever encounter data that could benefit from the use of these uh these functions let me go ahead and give you your last view quiz answer for today today's last view quiz answer is a a as an apple a as an apple all right and uh and we'll uh, go ahead and end here for now and um we will see you guys. Uh, have a good weekend, and we'll see you guys on Monday.